Hello and welcome along to part two of this FM22 Northern Irish TV experiment with me, Daniel. We are back today to look 10 and 15 years in the future to see if there's been any further progression from Northern Irish football, the teams within it, and where on earth they've been spending their TV money. So if you're looking forward to that and finding out which way natural regular income streams benefit Northern Ireland, then please do chuck a thumbs up on it. If you missed part one from last weekend, it is up in the eye above. There we showed you exactly what we set up, including how we put the English TV deal into the Northern Irish leagues in the editor. Don't forget, we haven't just done the top tier, we've done the whole playable league pyramid. We also looked one and five years in the future in that save with a few interesting and standout results. If you want to stay up to date with everything else on the channel then subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on. Daily FM22 content, there's links to all the key playlists in the eye above. It's been a very interesting week and a half or so and of course you can support the show as a channel member down below by clicking the join button where you'll also find other links in the description too. But let's go and get into Football Manager because you don't want to look at my face and me talking about what experiment we've set up yet again. You want to see what's happened 10 and 20 years in the future. We initially said we were going to do 15, but I think 20 will give us a bit of a broader perspective. And here we are, 15th of July 2031, and we're back to look at Northern Irish football. Now, we're going to do very similar to what we did in the last episode. We'll look at the leagues, we'll look at the clubs, but we're also going to have an additional focus today. Now, those of you that have been on the channel since 2021 and saw the Banger save and the Welsh experiments, you'll know what comes with the territory when we get further into the future. When a league is developing, we're going to want to look both at their reputation as a league and we're going to want to look at the coefficients. So that is something we'll have a look at today. But for now, let's go and take a look at the Irish league system and find out what on earth has been happening in the first five years since we've been away. Well, first things first, on a normal view, looks like all of the sides at the top level still professional and still rich. There's definitely been further improvements when it comes to facilities, though. A lot of them moving up into the realms of good and great across the board. Some of them are still stagnating at adequate as they were previously, but I'd imagine they're sides that might have been relegated or sides that may have had other opportunities. Now, Glenarvan are our first superb of the lot. So that's one we're going to have a look at in a bit closer detail. Great for Glen Torren, who were actually lagging behind five years ago. They're in a Champions League, so must have won the league. Institute, a bit further down on the average. And then moving forward, we're on the goods and greats. And the higher ones are generally the ones that have had European football by the looks of it, or that we would have expected to. No new stadiums, no semi-pros. So from the top tier, nothing unexpected there. Let's have a look at what the second tier can produce. Looks like, again, a mix of adequate and goods, all rich now. And the facilities have definitely stepped up from where they were at the start. There's the first below average, but that's the side expected to finish bottom. Everyone else, though, is adequate or good, which we can't really complain about. Maybe Nuri a slight surprise. They're predicted to finish second in the second tier, but have below average youth facilities. But that's definitely a priority for the nation. And superb training facilities for Queen's University. There are some that are really moving forward here. Let's go down to the third tier. Has everyone managed to turn pro now? There's a few going through takeovers, but that shouldn't matter because the money isn't linked to the owners this time. The facility is not quite as good and one or two that are still secure finances, largely actually across the league that's the case. But professional, one semi-pro side who I presume have come up maybe for the first time because they're so far behind the rest. But everyone else professional, all adequate or just below average facilities pretty much. And a mix of secure with the odd rich in there. So really pleased with that. The league and the structure behind the scenes, which will affect the future campaigns, is starting to move forward. What we need, though, which it doesn't look like has happened based on the side's reputations, is them to really push on on that front so they don't keep losing players for nominal fees and they can start to really build their nation. Because what we saw with Bangor City in our FM21 Builder Nation, is once the reputation got to three star for both the leagues and for the clubs, suddenly the value skyrocketed from that sort of few hundred thousand up to the 10, 15 million that you'd probably expect from sort of the top Scottish players, as you've seen in recent years in real life. So 
that's maybe where there's the slight problem at the moment. And looking at these clubs, most of them seem to have a very similar reputation. What we're going to do, though, is go and have a look at the league, see who's been winning it, what sort of transfer fees we've got, and then we'll move on to the coefficient side of things. So let's discard and exit that. We go to the league screen, which immediately shows that Linfield and Glen Torrent, the rivals, are sharing the league titles in the capital. But most importantly, the competition reputation is up to 60th. Now, it was 100 and something at the five-year point, wasn't it? So it's made big, big strides forward. What is the competition reputation now? It is two-star ability. So it's gone past Scottish League One and is level now with the Scottish Championship, effectively. So that is a big step forward. Having said that, it's still got an awful long way to go. And for 10 years of... Basically, these clubs at the top level will have had 800 million in TV money now, plus whatever they get for where they finish, plus their games on TV. It does seem a little bit off that it's not been able to progress further, but it's still a good sign. We have to accept in FM, I think, and it's the thing I'm finding hardest, the reputation is more important than money. So this build is probably going to take longer than we expect, and it might not even be done at 20 years. Of course, as we go along here, if you want to see a third episode with 30 and 40 years, then tell me, but it will probably depend on the progress at a 20-year mark. If we have a look at the transfers, just so we can see the size of them, it's early in this preseason, so I'm not going to get worried about 70 grand. Let's go back to the last year we had last time as a reminder. 250 grand, but mainly were players from the lower leagues of England or ones that were domestic transfers. Let's move on to the year after. 300 grand, so slightly improved again. Few players leave in Northern Ireland, though, for English clubs there. Not the way round we want to see that. Season 7, we've got bigger transfers. So that's maybe a good sign that a player has left Northern Ireland but got half a million pound of transfer fee. It's a very good player, though. I doubt they can replace him. Other ones largely domestic, signings from the lower leagues, which maybe helps as well, and other players moving to the country for a bit of money. Season 8, 575 grand, Linfield losing superstars, and they're very good players that they're bringing through. So the academy facilities and that are definitely working. Not much else to write home about though, everything else is virtually domestic. Season 9, 300 grand, but... Linfield buying players from the likes of Preston, that's a good sign. In fact, both clubs did. Paul McElroy, they're not the best players, and they are mainly Northern Irish or well over the hill. But it is still a positive sign that they're signing from bigger name clubs. And in some cases like that, they're pretty decent players. Let's move on to last season. Oh, we've got our first £1 million transfer. And it's a player that Lana bought from Derby County, Fraser Burgess. He's not bad, and he's Scottish rather than Northern Irish, so that's a good sign. And he's only on five and a half grand a week, so I'm hoping those stupid contracts we saw in the last episode will have started to both calm down and come down quite significantly. But lots of players move into the Northern Irish League from English clubs, and we've got our first million pound transfer. That might be a watershed moment, and it was only this January, so maybe signs that the league is slowly starting to get there. Let's have a look at the two big clubs though. We've got Linfield and Glen Torrent sharing the titles. Let's start with Glen Torrent, alphabetical order, nothing else to it. The players there are... So they've signed someone who's a, an okay player. He was actually a legend of our Cliftonville FM20 save. But he's 96 grand a week for an average player. The ones further down from that are better players on middle wages, the 30 odd grand a week. So... That's better. It's better than it was. The issue is the reputation of the club hasn't come up. So the transfer values are still tiny, which means they can't make profits on players. So in terms of the general reputation, it's still locked at two star, which I would suggest means they're not doing too much in Europe. Perhaps they've reached the odd group stage, but we will have a look at the coefficient in more detail. They got to the Europa Conference group stages last year. They won a game away in Norway at Bodo Glimp, but... Aside from that, they're not getting out of the groups. They're not progressing further. And I guess with the two sides swapping at who's winning, they're probably not one of them really building their coefficient. And that maybe perhaps is the issue. Let's go and have a look at Linfield by comparison because they were paying silly money last time. They've got Michael Duff in charge. So the one thing I have noticed here is that the standard of managers is really going up. They're getting good names in and people with good attributes but that's not maybe being replicated so much on the playing side. 
Linfield paying much sillier wages. Kofi Balmer, one of the best young players in the league at the start. He's on 94000 a week. He's a Northern Irish international though. Paddy Lane's on big money. He's an okay player, but again, it's silly money for the standard. Jack Scott, not a great player. Charlie Allen, yeah, these players shouldn't be commanding the fees they're getting. And their squad, on the face of it, does seem weaker than Glen Torrens. Although, interesting to see, Chris Johns was one of those on massive money last time. He's come back down to 14 grand a week. So, they have been able to tempt some others back downwards. But that standard of squad is not what I was expecting to see. Although, they've got some better players on lower wages near the bottom. So, some surprises on that front. It seems... The ones that are coming from England, they're having to pay massive money. The ones that are coming from other Northern Irish clubs, they're better players and they're getting them at slightly lower prices too. So let's see how they've been getting on in Europe. The previous seasons, they went out in qualifiers. Basically, if they don't win the league, they're not getting to group stages. So a few years ago, they did make the Europa Conference groups. They won a game there. They won a game there. They won a game there. Have they got through? They have. So they have played in Europa Conference knockouts and actually drew their home leg against AZ Alkmaar. That's a very good effort. But then they've not won the league as a result of that and the next two years it's harmed them. So there are negatives for every positive, which is a frustration too. Is their reputation any better? No, still two star. So that seems to be the thing holding the top tier back. Let's go and have a quick look at the second tier just to see what the transfer fees are there. And that league reputation up to around where the Irish League started. So maybe some slight progress there. Level with the second tier in the Republic of Ireland. So not doing too badly. Let's have a look at transfers. 200 grand, the biggest one we saw last season. And that was a player going to Newry. But for the money, it doesn't seem like you're getting much standard of player. Looks like all the best players are going to the top tier. And the second just hasn't got the quality, has it? There's a few Irish lads coming over from the English League. But no one really stand out. Any silly transfer fees? We've got 900,000. Bellina Millar, traditionally the best youth system in the country. Probably changed a bit now, of course. Loffel signing someone for big money, who's okay, but probably shouldn't be getting that fee. And then the one we're going to go and have a look at, the other club, I know a top tier one is Glenarvan, because they've got really good facilities. So I want to see if they've got good young players coming through. It looks like some of their youth players are all right, actually. Mainly goalkeepers, but they are doing okay. Let's have a look at their 18s. Breakthrough prospects. Let's go and have a look at the third tier. A couple of hundred grand transfers here and there, but nothing really to stand out. And in terms of the reputation, what have we got in terms of clubs? We have a look at these. Half a start. So that's perhaps the thing that's most disappointing. The reputation just isn't developing. They're not able to get those bigger names in, despite having all the money in the world. They're not able to develop in Europe despite the league reputation going up. And I don't know why the league reputation's going up so much because it's not reflected in the coefficients. If we go and have a look at the nation club coefficient, it has moved up a little bit. It's 34th, but we've not seen a huge amount of progress. And what that still means, if we reflect that into qualification places, is that these sides coming in in the first qualifying round in Europe just aren't able to get a chance. We need them to get into that top 29 where they get in the second qualifying round. Some of them get a real chance to get into the third and the playoffs. And then maybe we can start to think about this league developing. So I think for us to see a picture of progression in 10 years time, this has to have got into at least the sort of low 20s. Because otherwise, there is no chance for this league to move forward. If that doesn't happen, we definitely won't do a part three. If it does, I'll let you guys decide in the comments. Let's just have a very quick look at the individual club coefficients. So if we go and have a look at Northern Irish sides, is anyone standing out in Europe? We have got, if we get to N, there we go. Limfield, 17 points, but that's because... They had that massive season where they got through in the group stages. Glentoran really disappointing despite the fact they've won a couple of league titles. And everyone else is basically a minnow by European standards. So that side just isn't happening. And with Linfield becoming big and then throwing away the title two years in a row, it's led to this situation where no one team is really pushing because Linfields will drop off as Glentorans develops. And he just gets stuck in this sort of middle ground. So that's the thing that's got to change in the next 10 years. I just want to quickly see the finances. The richest clubs in the world 
are Northern Irish and they're not even a top tier side, some of them. This has got to change. They're richer than the Premier League clubs because they've got nothing to spend it on other than their facilities. They're not getting the players. They've not got the big transfer fees. I really want to see some progress in the next 10 years. We need regular transfers in the seven-figure realms. We need regular solid players coming over. We could do with some slight reputation regression. And we need the nation in the top 30 when it comes to the European coefficient. If none of that happens, then this experiment's at a standstill. If it does, though, there may yet be hope for the Northern Irish League. Let's skip 10 years further in the future. 2041, here we come. And 10 years later, we're back to look at the same stats. We are now 20 years into this save. We're still seeing some slight progression, perhaps, on the facilities front, but still not a huge amount. And actually, a lot of them have stagnated now. I'm guessing they're getting to the stage where the boards are saying, well... We've got a good enough one for our reputation, so we are at a standstill till something else happens. Although, there's a slight reduction in the coal rain capacity, predicted to finish first in the Europa Conference, who so can't have won the league last year unless they've just gone out already. But their capacity is currently reduced, so maybe they're developing their stadium. I can't notice that pattern from anybody else at all. Glenarvan's facilities have actually gone backwards a bit. Glentoran's have gone backwards a bit. So actually we're seeing some regression, if anything, from some of the clubs in this nation. Does it mean investment is coming in other areas or does it just mean we've got stuck? Let's go and find out to the first couple of clubs. I think we have an immediate problem. Glen Toran have not won a title since 2033, which was their fourth in succession. They've then just vanished and disappeared. We've got Coleraine winning three, Larn winning two, and Linfield one, which is probably going to cause further issues with the coefficient later down the line. But look at the big news next to it. The competition reputation is up to 33rd. That is big news. We are talking a decent standard of league now. Two and a half star ability, but right on the cusp of three. That is the first sign that this nation is really moving forward. And it's only half a star away now from the likes of the Championship, from the second Bundesliga, from the top tier of the likes of Sweden, Slovakia. Really, really big standard. I'm looking forward to seeing what that means. Have we got any progression from some of the clubs here? And obviously we're going to have to look at some different teams. I'll start with Glentoran and Nimfield, who were dominant at the start of the decade. And in fact, before we do that, let me have a look at the transfer fees. So, some bigger ones this summer. We've got a player going from Rotherham to Coleraine, but he's not a great player. Let's look at the year before. 750 grand domestic, 500 grand near enough, MK to Institute, good standard of young player. Right, there's a big up in the standard of transfers. And these are very good players coming to the league. Look at that one to Linfield. So, they've got to be doing better in Europe. They've got to be, with that standard coming in. Look at that, the year before. Coleraine sold a player for 1.4 million, signed one for 1.3. Yes, he's 35 now, because we're a year and a half on, but he's a very good footballer. I'm really impressed. Look at the player that Lahn signed from Nottingham Forest. They're closer to their peak age at 30-odd. They're on modest enough wages. I'm getting excited, because I'm actually seeing real progression here. But is that going to be reflected in Europe? The year before, Coleraine spent £5 million on a player, a very good striker from Sheffield United. So they would have signed him at, what, 28, 29? That's incredible. He is a good Premier League striker. Right, we're seeing real progression. Coleraine, with a striker like that the last two years, they must have done something in Europe. They must have won games with a player like him. He's up there with the players we had at Bangor City when we were winning European matches. They've got another striker at Linfield who's very good. They can't even win the league. I know the players they're signing are generally either a bit older or a bit worse. But this is real, real progress in the standard of player we're seeing go across. It's perhaps not reflected across the whole league, but the top two, three, four or five, definitely that is the case. Crusaders the year before... 5 million signing from Liverpool. Scottish goalkeeper who's very solid. Preston, 2 million to Linfield. Left back, very solid. Coleraine, player from Charlton. That's the one they then sold on in the future. So they sold him for 1.6 and sold him for the same money. So he's keeping his value as well. The league reputation, because it's now on the cusp of three start, is meaning the player values is going up. 
that makes a huge difference moving forward. And Coleraine, they have been spending massive money in recent seasons, so they are now able to attract good players to the league. And it does seem, if we go back further, to have just been the last two or three years where that progression has really happened. So I'm hoping that that's because of something that's happened in Europe, but we can only cross our fingers on that front. Let's have a quick look at Linfield. Club reputation. Still two-star. Eddie Howe's the manager, though. I said this at the 10-year mark. The level of manager coming to Northern Ireland is massive. The league reputation's going up. The player reputation is now going up. Surely the club reputation has to follow, but they have to do well in Europe for that to work. If we have a look at the schedule now, Linfield aren't even in Europe this year, and they've got Eddie Howe in charge. Let's have a look at their wages. Right, there's still a few on big ones, but not the massive 90, 100 grand we saw before. They seem to be attracting players of their own right now, and we're almost balancing out at that level. Glen Torren, who started dominant at the start of the decade, they, by contrast, have got a player on 100 grand a week, who's an okay left back, a player on 62 grand a week, who's an okay centre mid, and then lots of squad players on less than that. In terms of their European campaigns, because they were winning the league every year, weren't they? They're not great, to be honest, even the years they were winning the league. So they did get to the Europa League group stages there. They got a point away at Kairat, nothing else other than that. The year before that, again, group stages of the Europa Conference. So it's just finding one team that can be really consistent in Europe. And given the signings Colrain have made, I'm hopeful it's going to be them. So let's have a look. Their manager is Tim Clancy, who's okay, not the best in the league, but solid enough. If we look at where they finished last year, they were third. So they'll still have European football despite winning the league. But prior to that, they've been 7th and 7th, so they must have gone really big with transfers. Their best player is apparently Niall McGoldrick. He is a quality centre midfielder. He's wanted by Rangers, but he's worth a million pounds, so that's good. The players that are in the stars we looked at are on 50-odd grand a week. Sam Devlin and, of course, Robertson, that superstar striker. And they've got a lot of players from abroad as well, looking at some of the names. So let's have a look at the schedule. How have they been doing in Europe? They've got Rijeka in a second qualifier this year. Last season, Europa League group stages, drew with Red Star, drew with Celtic. There are some big results in here, and they were close to a lot of the others. So Colrain were on the cusp, but then they didn't win the league again, which is where the frustration starts to come. Lahn won the league this year. How have they been doing in recent seasons? Their reputation, two and a half star. Right, progression. Lahn have got the biggest reputation in the league. Sebastian Haller is their manager. Had been at Glenarvan, but had also played at Napoli, Ajax, West Ham, Leeds. We all know the drills. Going to Dortmund in real life. Their key player is Oli Redford. Very solid footballer and centre midfielder. There's Northern Irish current internationals in these teams in the Northern Irish League. I think we're on the cusp of something big here. Their goalkeeper is an experienced man, but he's a very good player. Their biggest earners are on 70 odd grand a week, but they're Northern Ireland internationals in their 20s and a Welsh player in their 20s as well. There's still a few duds and crap ones about, but largely they're very good. How have you been getting on in Europe? You've lost to Malmo in a Champions League qualifying, so you're probably going out there. Year before, lost in the final qualifier of the Europa Conference. So the sides that aren't winning the league just can't quite get over the line into the group stages. I think that's the point where this save goes mad. If they can get two sides or more into European group stage football, they're going to really start to shoot up the rankings quickly. But at the moment, I'm going to presume when we go and have a look at the coefficient, that there is a real difference between the rate at which the league is progressing and the teams and the quality and what we're actually seeing in terms of coefficient. So let's have a look at where they are. They've got to be in the 20s, surely. They are 27th. Okay, so the two worst years are about to drop off. It looks like the last three years we've seen bigger transfer fees, bigger reputation increases, better players come into the league, better managers in the league, and better coefficients. So I'm really, really hopeful that 10 years later down the line, this league might be up in that sort of 15th, 20th region. If we have a look at the qualification places, 27th at the moment. Of course, it's a bit of a climb to get to the next sort of milestone, but 
they are moving in the right direction. And when we talk about Rijeka, who one of the sides we're playing, if you can beat those sides in the league's five, six places above you, it can make a real difference. We don't want to see them start going backwards. Let's have a look at the coefficients for individual clubs, because that is going to be key. Where there's been different league winners, I feel like this is going to be the area that's most harmed. Linfield were obviously shooting away last time. They had 17. Are other clubs going to be able to compete with that? Northern Ireland. 11.5 for Linfield. Nothing else because there's no consistency in the teams that are making it. So Coleraine now have really got that pressure. They've got 13.5 at the moment. Their best year is about to drop off. But they've got qualification now. Lana starting to make it. Can we see progress? I'm really actually quite hopeful based on the last 10 years that things are going really in the right direction. And the last three years in particular, they seem to have taken off a bit. But let me know down in the comments, do you think there's going to be any further progression? Do you think it's worth going another 10 years? Would you like to see that in the next episode? And just how much is reputation holding back realism in FM? Because having made 1.6 billion as a minimum in TV money, these top tier sides are not developing. And I really expect to see more at this point. So I'll be interested to see your thoughts below. If you want to see another one, it will be next Sunday lunchtime. Let me know in the comments. We'll go with the majority. And of course, subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on. Stay up to date with daily FM22 content. We'll have a new episode of Top 3 later today. You can find the full playlist in the eye above. There's also other key links up there too, as well as down in the description below. But thank you as always for your incredible support. I'll put the start of our new rebuilding save just above my head now. And maybe I'll see you here next week. You decide, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.